In this lecture, we're going to focus on drug synthesis, so I can show you some interesting chemistry involving heterocycles. We'll focus a lot on ring closures and just some general chemistry that is useful in synthesis that maybe you haven't seen. We'll start by looking at the synthesis of doxepin. This drug is used to treat depression, anxiety, and insomnia, and it does so by inhibiting the reuptake of neurotransmitters. Briefly in the brain, neurotransmitters are released, they do their job um, in the nerve synapse, and then they're taken back up. But in some people, this process, they don't do their job long enough or they're reuptaken too quickly, and so this inhibits that reuptake and allows them to do their job for longer, which can modulate the mood. Doxepin belongs to the class of tricyclic antidepressants, and you can see the three rings in its structure. In the first step of our synthesis, sodium hydroxide deprotonates phenol, creating a phenoxide. The phenoxide does SN2 chemistry at this primary bromide. This sets the stage for our ring closure. In the first step shown here, we have sodium hydroxide doing a simple ester hydrolysis. And so we go from the ester, which has an abbreviated structure COOC2H5, and we get to the carboxylic acid. Now, I think here they need a protonation step to get to the acid, if it is truly the acid they are using in the next step. So I'm just going to add H+, and we'll say we've added a workup in here. So promoting the ring closure from our carboxylic acid is kind of challenging. Carboxylic acids are not easily attacked at the carbonyl carbon because of resonance stabilization. So a way to make them more activated is to convert them into the triflate. Triflic anhydride is a really hot electrophile, so even something that's not very nucleophilic, like a carboxylic acid, can attack it. We get this Switter ion, and we could show a proton transfer. Now, this is assuming they did actually do this reaction on the carboxylic acid and not on the carboxylate. We'll need to account for our proton and do a proton transfer. Then we can kick off our leaving group. The triflate leaving group is a very good leaving group because it has resonance stabilization and an inductive effect from the very electronegative CF3 group. Um, assuming we still have our, our proton around, this will be protonated. We'll have a proton transfer to activate the correct carbonyl for the ring closure. And then we just simply get electrophilic aromatic substitution similar to a friedel crafts acylation reaction. So we get our attack, elimination of triflate again, and if we call this compound here our target, just losing one proton after this step will give us that product. Next we have indomedicine. This is used to treat fever, pain, inflammation, and a few other things. It does so by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzymes. These are commonly called COX, and there's COX-1 and 2. And the COX enzymes are involved in prostaglandin synthesis, which is critical in the inflammation process. These are classified as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAID, and I'm sure you've seen this abbreviation before. Our synthesis begins with the fischer indel synthesis. The starting point of that is nucleophilic attack by the terminal amine on one of these carbonyl groups. How are we going to control regioselectivity here? We have two carbonyl groups. Well, we have a difference in reactivity in each of these groups. The ester is going to be our least reactive group in this molecule compared to the ketone. We have this, these lone pairs on oxygen here, and they're tied up in resonance with the carbonyl, giving it extra stabilization. So we'll get attack at our ketone. And with the fischer indole synthesis, we'll need to have acid added into this uh, equation here. Now the compound that they show is not set up. It doesn't look quite right to do the fischer indole synthesis, and this is because they're showing the imine form. We can convert this to the enamine, Upon treatment with acid, we'll get protonation of the nitrogen, subsequent enamine formation. Let's start the mechanism below so you can kind of see how this works. The first step of this is a 3-3 sigmatropic shift, where we get electrons kind of moving in a circle, sort of like the Diels-Alder mechanism if you draw it out that way. So we get our aromatic ring attacking the double bond, shift of electrons and cleavage of the nitrogen-nitrogen double bond.
This gives us our bisimine that wants to re-aromatize. And so if we protonate this nitrogen, we can get re-aromatization readily. Now we have a nucleophilic amine, and this can close down on the imine that we have after protonation to form an aminium ion. We will lose a molecule of ammonia and get our double bond that way, and in a few steps we'll get to our target compound. Moving on with our synthesis, we get cleavage of the ester with NaOH, probably followed by an acidic workup to get our carboxylic acid back, and then we have this DCC coupling. This compound, dicyclohexyl carbodiamide, is used to activate acids to undergo nucleophilic attack. Let's see how this works. The nitrogen atom of DCC gets protonated immediately by the very acidic carboxylic acid. Let's continue the mechanism here below. Now our carboxylate anion can attack at carbon pushing the electrons up onto the iminium nitrogen atom. Now we went from a carboxylic acid, which is not very susceptible to nucleophilic attack, to a very activated compound. In the next step, terp-butanol can attack, and now this, when it undergoes attack, we can show the electrons coming up. If we want to use uh, the abbreviation from the Clayton book, we can show the electrons coming back down. And then cleaving off this urea portion with the assistance of zinc, probably coordinating that nitrogen. After a workup, we get our terp-butyl ester and urea. This is a preferred reagent in this case rather than using maybe a Fischer esterification because we don't want to really boil our indole with acid. We could probably get side reactions going on. So DCC offers us a mild way to perform this reaction. Now the reason that ester was put on the molecule, you see in the end we actually want our carboxylic acid back, was to prevent a side reaction in this next step. So here we have the nitrogen getting acylated by this acid chloride. Now, if we didn't protect our carboxylic acid, we could have our carboxylic acid react with our acid chloride in a side reaction. And so we'd get nucleophilic attack and probably complex mixtures. So we can put on that protecting group and then remove it with high heat. So the terp-butyl ester is susceptible to deprotection at high temperatures. Let's see how this works. We can show this cyclic transition state for this process, where we show the carbonyl oxygen of the ester attacking a proton. This causes an alkene to form, and we get our carboxylic acid back by the final electron movement, if you will, in that circle. So this gives us our acid and a molecule of isobutylene. Next up, we have nalodixic acid. This is an antibiotic that is especially effective against gram-negative bacteria. It inhibits bacterial growth and reproduction by binding to their DNA. So the active metabolite that's produced from this compound will bind strongly to the DNA, but reversibly. It is a quinolone antibiotic because of this ring structure. In our first step, we get a Michael addition. However, our Michael acceptor has a built-in leaving group. So let's see how this works. We get nucleophilic attack of the amine on this carbon here, pushing the electrons up through the carbonyl for a resonance form. And then uh, let's draw this down here. We can show collapse of our electrons and pushing out of the leaving group. I left our amine protonated, and just if we call this our target, a simple deprotonation will lead us to that. Our ring closing step is an electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction, and this activated pyridine is going to attack. Having the amine there is helpful, and we could even draw a resonance form that uses the lone pair of the amine to show how this is activating the ring. Because of geometry, we get attack at the 3 position, and electronics favor this attack as well. 
if you note in our product, we have an alcohol, and this attack and displacement, this um, acyl substitution reaction will actually give us a carbonyl. So once we close the ring, we will actually use a lone pair on nitrogen, and we can show how we get a second double bond in the ring, and that causes us to form an alcohol instead. The next step is a straightforward cleavage of the ester to the acid. Again, there's probably a workup step here to arrive at the carboxylic acid. Then we have a little bit of an interesting process where we get the purity nitrogen, the least sterically hindered purity nitrogen, and I guess it's activated by the OH at the 4 position as well. We get that attacking at ethyl iodide, SN2 reaction. That gives us a charged species, which then is reacted with the base that's in, um, in the same pot, and that deprotonates the ring. We can push electrons through the ring, satisfying the positive charge on nitrogen, and that gives us our quinolone structure. Omeprazole, shown here, is a proton pump inhibitor. It's used to treat indigestion, and it's a really interesting process. It actually goes uh, undetected through your system until it finds its way to the parietal cells of the stomach, where the acidic environment causes it to convert into an active form, and then it will inhibit the proton pump in the stomach irreversibly, reducing acid. The synthesis is really cool. It starts with pyridine, and we do a nucleophilic attack on pyridine by activating with methyl lithium. So we get coordination of the lithium, attack by the methyl group, and then elimination of hydride, similar to the chichibobin reaction. Treatment with peroxide and acetic acid forms RN oxide, which you might recall undergoes electrophilic aromatic substitution quite readily at the 4 position. And so here we can show our electron flow from the oxygen of the N oxide to do that EAS reaction. So our intermediate is going to be this nitro compound, which undergoes displacement when treated with methoxide. And again, the N oxide resonance helps this process to occur. Our methoxy compound is then acylated on the methyl group at the 2 position. This reaction is a pretty cool mechanism, so let's go over it. When an N oxide is treated with acetic anhydride, it attacks, and in a few steps, we're going to get the acyl group on the oxygen of the N oxide. The process of reacting with acetic anhydride kicks off acetate as a leaving group. That acetate molecule can come back and deprotonate. Oh, the way I have my double bonds drawn in the ring, I will need to push all around the ring to show how we satisfy the positive charge on nitrogen and make this exocyclic double bond. We then get another 3-3 sigmatropic shift. So we get attack of the alkene at oxygen. This bond shifts to the other oxygen and we get cleavage of the NO bond, giving our acetate directly. Our next step is again a straightforward ester cleavage with sodium hydroxide. And this affords an alcohol on our molecule because um, of the connectivity of the ester. So the carboxylic acid is the group that we're not even uh, showing here. Then treatment with thionyl chloride gives this chloride, which is ready for the second stage of the reaction. We'll first get NaOH deprotonating our thiol to give uh, this anion here, which undergoes SN2 reaction. We have TBAB in here, tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. This is a charged but hydrophobic reagent, and what it does is it helps with phase transfer, and so it transfers molecules from the aqueous and organic phase. Here we have a mixture of DCM and water, and if you mix this up in a separatory funnel, you would see two separate layers with the DCM on the bottom. So we're stirring this reaction rapidly and trying to get things that are soluble in the water layer into the organic layer, and so TBAB is the reagent that helps with this process. The final step of our synthesis is oxidation of sulfur, and this can be done with any peroxy acid. Let's go ahead and show this mechanism. I like to begin with the carbonyl because I know that this is going to form, the carbonyl oxygen will form the new bond with the hydrogen. So I'm going to start my attack there, 
And then this oxygen that's being broken off can attack sulfur while sulfur also acts as a nucleophile and simultaneously attacks it. We can show this next arrow kind of cleaving the bond here and this becomes our new carbonyl. And I guess the way I've drawn this, I kind of need to extend this arrow here from the double bond to make this whole cyclic structure. And this is the most arrows, I think, in any undergraduate organic mechanism. Um, we have the oxygen attacking and being attacked and this cyclic kind of transition state that allows for formation of acetic acid and omeprazole in our case.